Behind me are uh, <laughs> legends of, of professional wrestling. Um, their contributions are absolutely indelible, and together uh, as a whole, they've changed the landscape of professional wrestling as we know it. Um, so we've got Larry the X Hennig. Greg Gagne. Jim Brunzel. And I will be turning it over to a wrestling historian and published author. He wrote Minnesota's Golden Age of Wrestling. So without any further ado, please welcome George Shire. Thank you. Good morning. And it is early, but we're wrestling fans, so it's never too early, right? Yeah, always too early. All right. <laughs> before, you better. before I go any farther, I want to tell you a little bit what we're going to do today and how this is going to work, because I want this to be your seminar, and we're going to get to that part. But before I do that, I don't want to be up here talking for the next hour or a little bit longer, however long it is, because we want to hear from these guys. And I know some of you know who they are. You, you just got a brief announcement, you know, what legends they are. But I want to give you a little bit about each guy, and you'll understand why they are legends. First of all, I'm gonna, I'll go right here with Larry the Axe Hennig. And for Larry the Axe Hennig, we could clap all day. But let me tell you something. When we're gonna talk about a legend, I'm gonna make this quick with each of them, but I, I want you to know this. Larry Hennig entered the business in 1957. He was, had some of his early training from Vern Gagne. He started in 57 against a guy named Billy Wicks, who was the real deal, right? Billy Wicks was the real deal when it came to wrestlers. We've heard of, we've heard of Hooter, or Hooters. We've heard of, <laughs> we've heard of Shooters and Hookers. The wrestlers have heard of Hooters. But Larry, for the first few years of his career, like many of the wrestlers of that era did, worked a lot of the preliminary matches, learned his trade well, and for those of you that are a little bit older, you may know that by 1961, Larry was in main events against a guy named Mr. M, Bill Miller, Dr. Bill Miller, under a mask. Had some of his first uh, big matches. Toured Japan, 1962, became a tag team champion for a while with a guy named Duke Hoffman, Bob Liebler was his real name. Then Larry went to Japan and again, came back, and when Larry came back that time in 1963, we noticed a change. For a while he was uh, known as Big Red Hannon, a little rougher, a little meaner in the ring. He teamed up with a guy by the name of The Crusher, who was a bad guy at the time, and they were, we blame The Crusher for his bad influence at the time. <laughs> and then it happened, this, this is big, in 1964, Larry Hennig became Pretty Boy Larry Hennig. And he teamed up with Handsome Harley Race. For the next, from 1964 to 1969, Larry Hennig and Harley Race, Pretty Boy and Handsome, were absolutely the hottest tag team in the entire AWA and Midwest. They were in main event, main event, main event against the Crusher and the Bruiser, who now went to the babyface side. And Hennig and Race were champions three times. Larry then became, uh, teamed up after Harley left the AWA. Larry teamed up with Luscious Lars Anderson, who was Larry Hainimi. And he had a good run with Larry Hainimi. Then he teamed up with a very young, boisterous 
dirty, dusty roads as a bad guy. And Big Dust used to come out on interviews and call him Lawrence Henry Hennig. Remember that? They had a good run together. Larry then took off for a little bit, came back about 73 after he got a run out in uh, New York, had a chance to wrestle WWF. If I did it the way the Baron and Von Raschke does, it's WWWWF. But the WWWF in those days, and it was Larry Hennig against Pedro Morales. And then he came back to the AWA real quick, and he was still a bad guy, but he'd grown a beard, and it was Larry the Axe Hennig. And he was still feuding with the Ganyas. He wanted Vern, he wanted Greg, and... Yeah, it started early. <laughs> but then, the way wrestling worked in those days, something happened. And Larry was teamed up with Buddy Wolf and Larry Hainimi, and they teased you with a falling out, where Larry might have been falling out with his partners. And then it happened on TV, and this is on YouTube, you guys, if you want to ever go to this. Um, Greg Gagne and Jim Brunzel, they were wrestling against Nick Bockwinkle and Ray Stevens and Bobby Heenan on TV. And the bad guys were getting the better of them. And a bunch of wrestlers came out, got thrown out of the ring, and Larry the Axe Hennig came out. And at first, the fans thought, oh boy, now Larry's going to join in on it. But Larry turned good guy that night. Larry the Axe Hennig then for the next the rest of his career was uh, one of the greatest baby faces that the AWA had. So He saved my life. He did. He carried him out. You'll see him, see him on TV. He carried Greg out. That, that was the first mistake. <laughs> So that's Larry the Axe Hennig, and a kinder, nicer gentleman you'll never meet. And we're going to have Larry talking with us a little bit. Sitting next to him is Greg Gagne. And uh, Larry used to refer to him as the son of Flicka back in the, back in the 70s. But uh, Greg Gagne, second generation, had his training by Vern Gagne and Billy Robinson. And all of these guys, I will point out, had training by not only some of those guys, but everybody they wrestled. Because when you were on the road traveling, it was who you were working with. You picked up things, things that worked for you, things that didn't. And that's what made them all so great. And Greg Gagne, uh, I can only tell you this. Greg wasn't the biggest wrestler by big standards, by big standards go. But I'll tell you this. I personally, and I'm not saying this because he's just here, I personally never saw Greg in a bad match. Greg gave 110% in every doggone match he ever wrestled. And here is the greatest compliment in the world when Nick Bockwinkle said, that man was a night off in the ring. And Greg, and Greg tell him what that means. Well, it meant to my daughter that I was fortunate. <laughs> We have a thing coming up with the Minnesota Twins and they wanted George to do a little bio for us and that's what he put in there. And she said, now why would you say that? Didn't anybody have any respect for you? Did you that bad? I said, no, there's another way of looking at it. And they all went into it. So no, I guess it was a nice comment. Usually when a wrestler says that wrestling someone was a night off, it means that they were fun to work with, they were good to work with, and they enjoyed working with him. Simple as that. Greg Gagne went on to become AWA Tag Team Champion with Jumping Jim Brunzel. And back in that era, in the 70s, tag team wrestling all around the country was huge. And if you looked around, every territory had their top babyface team or their top heel team. But bar none, the High Flyers were one of the hottest tag teams in wrestling. They were two-time AWA Tag Team Champions. They were in the ring with Bockwinkle and Stevens, and you guys that were at the banquet last night, you know some of the teams that Greg mentioned. An outstanding tag team. Next to him, the, the, really the high flyer. You see that picture they showed on the video last night of Jimmy in the air <coughs> delivering that drop kick? Absolutely, and I've heard more wrestlers than you can count say how good his drop kick was and how believable it was. 
And there were a lot of wrestlers that used the drop kick, but Jumpin' Jim did it better than no one. Look real. He knocked, he knocked out two wrestlers, probably more than that. Yeah. Pat Patterson and Stan Hansen. Oh. <laughs> so, Jumpin' Jim Runzel, of course, the other half of the High Flyers with Greg, and extremely popular tag team, very over. And Jimmy was also in Kansas City, as you heard last night, teamed up for a while with Mike George, one of their Central States Territories uh, top rookies at the time. 1974, they were Central States Tag Team Champions. And they had a nice run against Roger Kirby and Lord Alfred Hayes down there. And then uh, Hayes and Kirby also came to the AWA and worked some matches against the Flyers. So that was, uh, that was fun too. And then later on you saw him in the WWF when the F was still in the E instead of the E. And he was uh, with B. Brian Blair as the Killer Bees. Masked Confusion. That was a fun tag team. So that's our elite panel, folks. And give them one more hand, and then let's get this thing going. Larry was down playing on a video machine and you were sleeping. I was afraid that I was going to have to announce that the program is subject to change and one of them missed a flight from Chicago. That was always the old story. Okay, here's the deal, guys. I'm guessing you're all AWA fans. So what we want to do is let's just make this a fun Q&A and... We've all got questions that we want to ask the wrestlers. We've all got questions about the AWA. Let's do it, but we're going to do it uh, in order. We don't want everybody talking at once. We want you to raise your hand, and let's ask your question. You can ask it directly to all or any of them, and we'll get it going that way, okay? So who would like to be first? All right, we got... Franklin Lee from Wichita Falls, Texas. My question is for the entire panel, and that is, what was the road schedule like back in the old days of the AWA? I think you're about hearing you. What did he say? He, he wants to know what the road schedule was back in the AWA. What type of travel did you have to do when you were working? Do you want to answer a little bit of that? Or? <laughs> but before I get started, I'd like uh, everybody to know that Kyle is here representing the Hall of Fame in Waterloo. I will thank you for that. And then, uh, I was inducted into that Hall of Fame. <laughs> you skipped over that kind of lightly. <laughs> Now we're talking about the roads, right? The roads were long and hard, there were hours and hours, and now we're talking about on the two-lane highways now, and dirt roads. And, uh, and uh, it was a long, hard journey. But after everything is said and done, I've got uh, five children, had five children, um, Married over 60 years to the same lady. And uh, the last thing she said to me when I left this morning, uh, leave some money. <laughs> and I have 25 grandchildren. Wow. So as you can see, I didn't spend all my time on the road. <laughs> I had some other things going on. And uh, of course I was hoping that my great tag team partner, Harley Reese, could have been here. Uh, we've been friends for all these years, and right now his health is not too good, but uh, uh, he, was a, he was a real guy. He was a tough guy. And he was an honest guy. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, you'll get better. Thank you. And in 
addressing uh, Franklin's question about the road, um, the fellows who were in the AWA got spoiled because uh, not only was it a great area, we only had about 12 to 16 dates a month that we worked. And then it even lessened off in the summer. So uh, Vern and Wally realized that, you know, we all had families and uh, uh, we all appreciated the time that we had. Uh, conversely, uh, when I was down in Kansas City, I wrestled every day, Monday through Sunday, twice a night. And uh, I remember the first week I was there, I made $157 for 14 days, in the, you know, 14 times in the rain. So uh, that was a rude awakening. And, and then also when I went to the WWF, um, and I have this in all my books, I, I saved all my books, uh, Brian and I, as the Killer Bees, Averaged 27 days a month for three years on the road every day flying and we went 42 days in a row I broke my hand in Rochester came home uh, Had a cast put on it went back and uh, one more match is with a cast than we did I think with our masks so um, And some guys actually went 95 days uh, Cosro Vaziri the Iron Sheik was gone so long that when he went home uh, he drove right past his house because his wife did some renovation and he didn't even recognize it. So, the AWA was the best place to work for, really. It was uh, a treat and I think everybody who uh, worked for Vern and Wally uh, realized that. And then, you know, you made great money, you had uh, a lot, you had great guys to work with, like they mentioned before. I can only duplicate what Jim said. It was a great place to, to work. And, and uh, you know, I remember sometimes uh, it got a little difficult. We had a couple of really tough runs when we first became champions. We went 15 days straight and then uh, from Salt Lake City flew to, uh, flew to Japan uh, where we did two weeks over there. And uh, we had a tough match in Salt Lake City where I tore my cartilage in my knee. But we flew to LA, ice on the knee. Got into Tokyo, uh, had to jump on a plane to Sapporo, got in the cab, they told us to get dressed in the cab. We went from the cab, this is uh, 18 hours in the air, and right into the ring. And then uh, the next, uh, we had about a 15, 16 minute match that night. The next night we had Saru and Tenaru for an hour, and then 45 minutes the next night with uh, Giant Bubba and Dory Funk Jr. And then the third night we had, uh, we had a war. We had Stan Hansen and King Kong Brody, and uh, it wasn't a night off. <laughs> Hope that answers your question, and very quickly, I just want to tell you that Larry Hennig was inducted into the Hall of Fame in Waterloo, Iowa. guys have been inducted into Hall of Fames and you know any Hall of Fame that's out there that doesn't have these guys in it isn't a Hall of Fame yet that's all I can tell you but yes and Kurt Henning second generation Mr. Perfect he's also in that Hall of Fame in Waterloo Iowa this summer <laughs> this summer if you get a chance to go down there on the weekend of Kyle isn't it the 20 something 21st July 21 through 23rd of July, Waterloo, Iowa, the uh, Dan Gable Museum, George Trangos Luthez, Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame. If you haven't been there, you gotta go. If you've been there, you know why I just said that. It's that much fun, so. Okay, next question. Uh, Bob, you Bob, you wanna go? Yeah, Bob Johnson? Yeah, Bob Johnson, Calgary. Uh, I wanna ask Larry, I understand you uh, had a chance to go to Calgary and uh, work with Stu Hart. Can you tell us what that was like? He it was cold. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to know? <laughs> yes, it, 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 was a, it was an experience. Uh, and Stu Hart liked to wrestle amateur and professional. And uh, we spent some time down in his basement between the dog shit and the baby shit that we were in. It, it, it was a real experience. Uh, but 
Uh, he was a he was a, a, a real real uh, good promoter for the towns that they had, and uh, I enjoyed it. And it was a great experience. So. Uh, Stu, uh, let's see, Stu Hart and Brent Hart and my <coughs> son Kurt had one of the greatest matches of all times. Uh, in fact, it is in some of the Hall of Fames. Uh, and uh, I was very proud to be there and I'm very proud to be here. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I want to tell you something. When you hear Larry talking today, you know, he's a little more subdued and a little more uh, one, one word answers. But those of you that remember back in the interview days when pro wrestling, they came out, they knew what town they were going to wrestle in, they knew their opponent for the night, and then they went for the next two minutes. This guy was as good as anyone on the microphone. And his interviews are classics. So, anyway, next question. Darla. My question is for Jim. Um, I asked the same question to him a couple of years ago in Waterloo, but there are so many different people here now. And I'd just like to know who your favorite tag team partner was to work with. Ooh. Jim? <laughs> Well, Darla, I, I think I'll give you the same answer that I gave you then. And the best tag team partner I ever had was my wife, Mary. <laughs> I was very, very blessed to have such three great partners. You know, starting out with Mike George in Kansas City, and then uh, in the AWA with Greg, and then in the WWF with Brian. I mean, it was. It was uh, a wonderful time, and, and uh, we had success in all three areas. And, uh, honestly, we all remain close friends, which is pretty hard to say, you know, in this wrestling business, especially with some tag teams. So, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, it went by like that, you know, 25 years. You don't realize it. And uh, uh, the sad thing is that uh, pro wrestling really doesn't prepare you for anything. And now it's gotten a lot better. The guys are under contract to make them huge money. I, I, I was talking with Bob Orton Jr. The, uh, the other week in New York, and his son uh, Randy makes three hundred fifty-nine thousand dollars a month. A month. So, and he wants to be a wrestler. Yeah. So, but he's he's also had a second surgery on his shoulder, and he's been out for I think uh, nine weeks. So before, yeah, before, you know, if you got hurt, you didn't get paid if you didn't wrestle. So now it's, it's progressed to the point where these guys are getting well compensated and, you know, more power to them. You know, one of the things I want to touch on real quick, last night we heard Greg Gagne pay tribute to his wife, Mary. Uh, for being a great tag team partner and his family. We heard Greg, we heard Jim Brunzel just pay tribute to his wife, Mary. They're, they both have wives, Mary. They're not the same Mary. <laughs> but, but, no, I, I understand. <laughs> but, for those of you that were at Waterloo back in 2013, Jim Brunzel gave pretty much the same speech that Bert or that uh, Greg. Greg. <laughs> you always call me Roy, so. Thanks, Wally. <laughs> but uh, Jim Brunzel gave pretty much the same speech about his tag team partner, Mary. And then, you know, Larry has been married for how many years did you say, Larry? Over 60. Over 60. So you look at the guys up here, and here's the reason I bring this up. With the road schedule that wrestlers had and the types of travel that they did and they were away from their families, these guys would be the first to tell you that wrestling families didn't always work. And a lot of guys went through a lot of marriages and a lot of partners, etc., etc. And we've got three testaments up here that it works, but they all pay tribute to their beautiful wives. And I think they deserve a hand for that. Our next question over here. Uh, earlier you guys mentioned that 
Uh, one time you had to go in the ring with Stan Hansen and Bruiser Brody, and you said it straight out, it's going to be a war. Uh, out of all your opponents, who was the one where you went into the ring and you're like, very unsure if you're going to be maybe walking out unscathed, you know? Larry, you want to start? Did you hear the question? Oh, uh, he, he's wondering who your toughest opponent was this show. Well, I, I like Brazil to go because every time I got a chance, they beat the shit out of him. And the reason for that was is that when he came from a different world, I mean, he was in, in track and field, great athlete. But uh, I, I didn't think that he was earning his money. So I got him in the corner and I beat him. I said, he, was, he had his first week, he made $500. I said, well, tonight you're going to earn it. And I don't think he ever got over that. He never was quite the same. I mentioned that last night. I, uh, for about two weeks straight, I had uh, eyelets from Larry's boots all across my belly and chest and neck. And uh, it wasn't easy. And uh, the, the question you asked, uh, there was a lot of guys that were both good uh, amateur wrestlers, tough guys, street fighters, and guys that were amazing athletes. And uh, I always think, and I saw a lot of tough guys, and, and Larry was an extremely tough guy, but in, in my era, um, there was a fellow who was from Tonga, Aku, without a doubt, one of the toughest, most agile, uh, he's a born killer. You'd have to actually shoot him to get him off you. Uh, I remember I worked with him in Japan, and he was 18 years old, and he was a little slimmer, and we, we did something off the ropes, and he hit me with the drop kick so damn hard. I, I saw stars for about two minutes, and it was great page. I know, and, and, and as he covered me, I said, how cool I'm supposed to give those, not take those. <laughs> he was my toughest. Matt Dog Sean. <laughs> Most unpredictable man I've ever been around in my life. First time I'm going to wrestle him in a single match was in Minneapolis. And I said to Vern, I said, Dad, what do I do with this guy? He said, hit him twice as hard as he hits you. I said, that's it? And that's it. Good luck. <laughs> so I went in the ring with the, the dog, and I went to lock up with him, and he, he cuffed me and open hand, and his hands were like cement blocks. You could feel it down in your feet when he hit you. And God, and I hit him back, and we exchanged about three, and about the third one, I hit him right over the ear. He kind of lost his equilibrium, so I grabbed a leg, and I took him down. I took a breath like that, and all of a sudden, he peeled all the skin off my back. Oh, oh. Oh. So in about 20 some minutes with the dog, got back in the locker room and I'm sitting there and he's laughing at me. I'm cut up, bite marks all over me. And I said, God damn, I'm glad. I hope I never have to get in the ring with that guy again. And all of a sudden the locker room door is kicked open. And here comes the dog. And I jumped up, grabbed my chair and I'm looking at him. And he goes, I respect you. I was crapped in my pants. And I was All righty, let's go with the second row here first, right? Thank you. Vern Guy has trained so many wrestlers. Do you think that guys like Flair and Steve Orwick would become as big as they did? And were there guys that you thought would be big but didn't quite make it so far? All right, before I give that to, I don't know, Greg, if you want to take it, but let's just point out that Vern Gagne trained. We sat down one time and tried to make a list, and it was like over 150 guys. And virtually the vast majority of them became big stars. So if you want to go... Well, I think when, when you look at talent, you know, you, you, Vern had a good feel for talent. He, he always told me back in 1950 when he first went on the DuPont Network, they didn't know the strength of TV at the time. And um, uh, his, in fact, the first time he went there, he came out of Oklahoma, they told him he was too small, but 
they were going to network TV and they wanted a young guy. And uh, he came up there and uh, Fred Kohler told him, Vern, tonight we're going to make you a, dress you up as a Martian and lower you out of the ceiling. And he said, the hell you are. <laughs> he said that I was a Big Ten champion, NCAA champion, uh, alternate on the, uh, the Olympic team. If I can't make it in my boots and tights, I'm not going in the ring. Uh, I'll quit. But tonight, line up all 30 of them that you got here, and they can come one, one, one at a time or two at a time, whatever they want to do. If I can't beat them all, I'm going to quit. But he realized with the TV then uh, what they needed for talent. And they had to be a change in wrestling. And him and Jim Barnett, Jim Barnett was writing programs at the time, had a good feel for talent. And he always had that regarding guys like Pat O'Connor and uh, uh, Hunt Schmidt, uh, Edward Carpentier, and uh, wanted good athletes that wanted to compete. So when people came into the camp, he made it hard on them in the first uh, you know, we'd have, he'd have 40, 50, maybe 100 guys there trying for a uh, tryout. And when you get done, you'd have about two left. And he knew that uh, Rick Flair, you had asked about Rick, uh, had tremendous potential. And uh, we were about, what, our third week into the camp when Rick decided he was going to quit. And uh, there was Ken Patera, Jim, the Iron Sheik, Bob Ruggers, and I out in the barn waiting no flare. And Vern says, where's flare? He said, well, we think he's going to quit. Vern left, the Billy with us took off, and Rick tells the story. He called him out of the house, and when he came out, he knocked him on his ass. He knocked Rick on his ass. He said, you're not quitting wrestling. Get back in there. You have too much potential. So he always had that good feel. And like George said, we counted over 150 wrestlers, and probably 98% of them all ended up being event wrestlers. So. Uh, you know, it was through the, the regiment that he put everybody through in the camp and uh, with his knack for picking up what good talent would be. And you've got to remember, too, that a lot of those wrestlers came out of Minnesota, so I just want to make one point here. You see Jumping Jimmy wearing a t-shirt that's the uh, Minnesota Hall of Fame, Wrestling Hall of Fame, and that's kind of a grassroots thing that's taking place right now in Minnesota. And this past summer, last August, Larry Hennig and Vern Gagne were the very first inductees. They were both Robbinsdale graduates uh, from Minnesota, and they both were inducted into that Hall of Fame, and Greg was there, of course, uh, excepting for Vern, who had passed away a year ago. Okay, we have, let's get over to this side again. Eric, you want to run with a question? Sure, uh, for Jim. Uh, yes. I know we're talking about Minnesota, but I grew up watching Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, and I remember you there, and I was just hoping you might uh, say a few words about uh, some of the people that you, you worked with there, and also uh, those trips to Canada that you used to make to go to Toronto. What were those like uh, in terms of, uh, I, I would imagine they were bruising because you would fly up there, you'd work three or four nights in a row, fly right back to the Carolinas. I just wanted your thoughts on working down there. Well, I remember when I went down to North Carolina, I met with George Scott, who was the booker uh, for Jimmy Crockett. And, and he said right off the bat, he says, Jimmy, he says, we don't give time off here. And I, I said, no time off? No. So uh, they had a great area, and it was hotter than hell because Flair, Roddy Piper, Ricky Steamboat uh, just set that place on fire. So, I mean, it was uh, a town a night. Uh, seven days a week. Sometimes we work twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday. I, I feel that I was probably in the best shape of my life there because I remember uh, in one week I did three one-hour draws with Rick Flair. And uh, could you answer that, please? Thank you. <laughs> tell, tell him I'm speaking at the time here. <laughs> but. Uh, it was a great area. Uh, I remember, and, and I, I, I wrote a book called Madlands, and, and uh, I, I really didn't get along very well with George Scott. And uh, I liked him, but he was, God, he was the worst booker that I ever faced. And I, I, I'll tell you one little instance. <laughs> George Scott, out of 
Yeah, God rest his soul. I, I had uh, just beaten the Iron Sheik on TV, and he had beaten me earlier using a loaded boot. He used to tap his boot, boom, and he covered me. So I was on TV, wound up beating him. I took his boot off, and I was wrestling him the next uh, Sunday in Roanoke, for, uh, Virginia. It was a main event. So I go on TV, and I said, I'm going to wear this boot. I don't need it, but I'm going to beat Cosgrove, Missouri. So we are the Iron Schnook, as I call him at that time. So we, we get to uh, Roanoke, and and Sandy Scott was the agent, so I'm waiting around, and I'm all dressed. And Cosgrove's over in the corner, and I said, uh, uh, Sandy says, did you get the finish for tonight? And I said, no. And he says, well, he says, um, I want you to do an hour Broadway. I said, what? <laughs> an hour Broadway? I said, I got his boot, and I can't beat him in an hour? <laughs> And he said, well, that's what George wants. And I said, well, I think George should get a plot for me and we can dig my uh, tomb right here in the middle of Roanoke because I'll be dead after this. So uh, we had a couple, and, and this is something real quick about George Scott. I first, <laughs> first time I'm in uh, South Carolina, Spartanburg, the very first match I had was Rene Goulet. And I'll really be quick with this. So George said, here's what I want for a finish. I want you to hit Renee with six drop kicks. I said, six? He said, yes. I said, how about if I just catch him off the rope real quick? One, two, three, he kicks out. Hang on, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Conversation uh, as close as I, to make a long story short, I had to hit Rene Goulet with six drop kicks. First one was at the top of his forehead, the second one was just below his nose, the third one was at his Adam's apple, the fourth one was just above his chest, the fifth one was right at his sternum, and the sixth one was a, a wrestler's idea of a vasectomy because I got it right in the ball. <laughs> I got him with six drop kicks and he never walked out of that ring. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I would expect this from a teenager. Larry Hennig, ladies and gentlemen, the world's oldest teenager. It's hard to believe, but I just celebrated my 80th birthday. Yeah. Okay, I want to take a, we're going to stay on this side for one more call, or a hand, and then we'll go over here. Turquoise shirt right there. Okay. First of all, Greg, it's the DuPont Network, not the DuPont. <laughs> oh, didn't I say DuPont? You said DuPont. You know what I want to what what I want to tell you is this, okay? We can't pick on Greg. Greg, I said to Greg a couple of times. I said, you know, Greg, this didn't happen this way or that way. And a year ago, a year and a half ago in October, Greg called me at home and he says it was a Friday. He leaves a message on my phone. He says. Well, I wanted to uh, let you know, and I still have that message saved because it's funny, but he says, I wanted to let you know that uh, tomorrow, Vern is being uh, recognized at the Robbinsdale High School from the alumni, and he's getting an award. And he says, I didn't tell you earlier this week because I have to give a speech, and I didn't want you there to critique it because you're going to tell me everything was wrong. But on the other hand, I know he respects me, for that reason, sometimes. <laughs> and here's the funny story about that. Last year when Vern passed away, the Saturday before the memorial service, I get a phone call from Greg and he says, George, when was Vern's first match? It was, uh, was May 10th, right? 49? I said, well, that's what you always said, Greg. I said, actually, it was May 3rd, a week earlier, 49. And I said he was with Abe King Kong Cashy, and 
He says, really? Well, can we change it? <laughs> I said, you can do whatever you want, but it was May, May 3rd. So at the memorial service, I had taken a copy of the newspaper clipping from that first May 3rd match and the results on May 4th of the card, and I just brought it and I handed it to Greg. I said, here, you can look at this later. So I don't know if you did it. <laughs> Vern always told me it was May 10th. So that's what I knew growing up. And May 10th was a big day for him. It was the day he got out of the service. He said it was the day of his first match, and the, the day of his last match. I don't think that was right either, but uh, <laughs> was there anything? I'm sorry I made that mistake for that. What else you got? Uh, remember the movie The Wrestler? What, what, what do you guys remember about that experience? 1974. Oh. Yeah, Ed Asner. I mean, Ed, uh, in fact, Ed sent us a nice note and a phone call uh, when Vern passed away. They still became, they became really good, close friends. Um, Larry, can, we were in the movie, both, all three of us. Uh, Larry can probably tell you more about it. I think he was around a little bit more than we were. Um, we were on the road at the time, but they shot some scenes of some of the training, and then um, they had me refereeing his and uh, Robinson's final match. It was, a, it was a different experience because uh, it was funny, after it was over, the shooting, Ed asked me, he said, why don't you come to Hollywood and be an actor? He said, I'll get you in. I said, nah, I, I want to wrestle. I really like the wrestling. And I probably made a mistake. <laughs> See what The Rock is doing, but I, of course I wouldn't do what he did. I was in the movie and they had the preview in St. Louis Park at the theater. And got, and got, I had to buy a ticket to get him to see the goddamn thing. <laughs> Everybody else was free. <laughs> I want to point out, since you brought up that movie, it was 1973-74, it was filmed in 73-74, it was released. And I mentioned earlier about the microphone skills of Larry Hennig, and at the very beginning of that movie, Larry Hennig is doing one of his classic interviews where he's getting down on Vern Gagne. I don't think Vern was Mike Bullard in the movie. But it was classic Larry Hennig because he's telling us out there that he's going to beat that bald-headed, spindly like Vern or Mike Bullard. And you got to watch it. It's classic. It's right at the beginning. All right. Um, blue shirt. Morris. Morris. Let's go. All right. Um, my first question is to... Two questions are for Jim, and then my next question is for all three of you. Uh, Jim, do you remember that interview um, Ray Stevens did when you had your staff infection at chari charity softball game? Ray Stevens, two Saturday nights in a row. The first Saturday, he said, um, Jim Burnzel, I saw your house. You've got an ugly house, and your feet were dirty on top of it. Second week, Roger Kent was just about out of time, and he said, um, Oh, to you, Jim Brunzel. Feet still dirty. You got an ugly house. You remember that? Jesus, I can't remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I remember we were playing this Diagon softball, and, and I slid, and I had a big strawberry. And then that evening we went swimming over it. Dick Anderson, who was uh, Vern's uh, college uh, football teammate and also uh, a doctor for the Vikings, we went swimming in the pool the next day. My Legs swelled up like a son of a gun, and I had uh, streaks going up, and I thought, well, I <laughs> went in. He said, God dang, you got a staph infection. You can't do anything for six weeks. So I, I think three days in a row I had uh, massive shots of uh, penicillin. And I can't remember what Ray Steven said, but if you said he said it, he said it. <laughs> I don't think the house was dirty, and uh, I know my, my feet were clean. <laughs> Question. How tough was Big Bad Bobby Duncan in single matches for all three of you? Not tag team, but single. Bobby Duncan? Yes. He was an unbelievable athlete. I remember the first time we wrestled him, he hit us with a tap, or hit me anyhow, with a tackle coming off the ropes. We knocked me in the next week. It was unbelievable. And, and uh, we were wrestling in, in Moline one night, and I said to Jim, I said, That damn Duncan tonight, when he comes off those ropes, I'm going to hit him as soon as he turns with a drop kick. Well, Bobby hit those ropes, I shot him in, and boom, he came off. I hit him with a drop kick. Next thing I know, I'm out on the floor. And, and Jim's down, and he's laughing his ass off and picking me up. And I said, 
what the hell happened? He said, you look like a freaking arrow going through the ring and out the other side. Duncan went out one way and I went out the other. <laughs> Bobby Duncan was one of the quickest Six foot three, two hundred and ninety-five pound guys you ever want. You know, he was a, a guard, he played at uh, St. Louis Cardinals. And he, he, he was a real low tempered guy. He always had a dip in his mouth and he always used to call us easy money. And I remember a couple times I hit him with a drop kick and that son of a gun to get up quicker than I did and he said, Come on, easy money, you're getting slow. <laughs> he, he was a marvelous guy, great guy. I heard he was driving a truck uh, down in Texas and uh, just a wonderful guy and a great athlete. He had he had bad knees too. His knees were you could grab his knees and move them like that, and he taped them up every night, and he did a hell of a job. It, Duncan was good for 15 minutes. He went balls out for 15 minutes, and then look at you and say, "We got to take this thing home." <laughs> <laughs> and we we just put him through another 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> I thought this was going to turn into the Gandhi Hour here. <laughs> you know, there are benefits to being the boss's son, too. You want to talk about that, Greg? <laughs> Greg was a great athlete along with Jim Brunzel. But there's one guy down here who says SPLX on his shirt. He's had his hand up and is frozen in that position. Would you? Please ask me a question because he's not going to call you. Maybe I should have waited before I called on you. I didn't realize they were going to pick on me, too. I feel like I'm at home. Greg, Jim, do you want to talk about Bobby? Because I could say a lot about Bobby, but do you want to talk about him a little bit? Because you guys worked a lot with him. Well, we, I think we said it all last night. He was, without a doubt, you know one thing about Heenan, and there was a lot of managers in wrestling. Um, when you're wrestling Bobby or his opponents, he had the ability to not only make his his part of the guys he managed, he made the opponents. And there was no other manager in wrestling that could do that. And Bobby did it outside the ring, on the mic, and then in the ring. He, he was the most unbelievable personality and manager that I think wrestling has ever had. And like I said last night, you know, if you combine every aspect of what a true great pro wrestler uh, would have, uh, Bobby had it all. The timing was incredible. His timing was uh, second to none. And then, you know, when he was in the WWF, he managed three or four guys, and he was going out to the ring three or four times. And in the interviews, he'd sit there all he'd sit there for eight hours straight because he was doing interviews constantly. For the, the different guys he was managing, and uh, I'll never forget. You know, Bobby used to like to drink a lot, as we all did. And uh, Denver was Friday night, and, and we had a great time in Denver, and, and it was a great bar there. So I remember this was a story. We came, we flew in on the early flight. We got back to Minneapolis at nine o'clock. We had to go do TV on Saturday over at Channel Eleven. So Vern and Wally were down at the table making. Uh, the chart for the, the schedule of the, the shows that day. And Bobby Heenan wanted to find out where Nick was and where Ray was, so he was looking over the shoulder, and all of a sudden Vern looked up at him, 
He says, he didn't, God damn it, you've been drinking. And Bobby looked down at him and he said, you can't smell vodka. <laughs> You know, I'm going to get to a couple of the questions, but when you speak of Bobby Heenan, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about that microphone work, and that was a lot of what Bobby Heenan was, how good he was on the mic, putting, putting his uh, wrestlers over and putting the matches over. And, you know, all of you who saw Nick Bachwinkel defend the title, you mentioned Mad Dog Bashan earlier. One of Bobby Heenan's classics was the night on Thanksgiving that he was, uh, Nick Bachwinkel had to defend the title to Mad Dog Bashan, who was really big, working as the baby face at that point, but Mad Dog was never a baby face. He was, as Greg said, you know, just unpredictable. Well, that night, Bobby Heenan, before the matches on TV, he comes on and he says, we're not going to have turkey. We're going to have dog. And he says, and when he's down, we're going to kick his teeth out. Both of them. <laughs> and I mean, I rolled on the floor, and when you think about it, it's the funniest line in the world. So, okay. Leno, you got a question? I do. Um, Go. And it was 73, but uh, uh, Vern, and this is actually George for you and Larry, maybe Greg could comment on it, but uh, it was, Steve Yoey knows, was it 67, 68 when Vern paired up with Jack Kent Cook in Los Angeles and they tried to go against my boss, Mike LaBelle. They had a stellar card. Larry Russell, Luthes, Vern put up the title against Bruiser. Just top to bottom, stellar card. I think there was only two or three shows. Maybe talk about why that may not have worked, uh, because there was all the NWA force, uh, promoters were sending guys into LA, you know, it was kind of one-sided. Whereas uh, when Shire retired in 82 in San Francisco, Vern came in, and it was really an immediate success in the whole Bay Area, Oakland and San Francisco for the AWA. What do you guys remember about that? And George, you probably know a lot of inside stuff. Well, I'm gonna just say this, and I'll give you my viewpoint, but I, I want Greg to answer this. But well, let's point out that you had mentioned Larry wrestled Lou Fez on that card. And there is a famous picture out there of uh, Lou Fez giving Larry Hennig a, I guess you call it a hip lock or something. You know the picture I'm talking about. And that came from that match. And Larry, of course, has the utmost respect for our, our friend, the late, great Lou Fez. You were great friends for a lot of years. And Lou was such a gentleman. You know, he was the... He carried himself so well as champion. He always wore a suit that was important that you dressed like you, you were something. And uh, that to answer your question about that forum deal though, and, and Greg's <laughs> gonna correct me on this one because I want him to if I'm wrong. But in those days, you know, the territorial system, if you had that handshake and that agreement that I didn't go into your town and you didn't come into my town, and occasionally we all know what happened. There were the little promotional wars and that sort of thing. And in most cases, it was the established promoter that ended up winning the thing. I think a lot of it had to do with the loyalty of the fans, what they've been used to. You may recall that the Bruiser tried to go into Detroit against Sheik Ed Farhat. And they battled it out, and of course eventually the Sheik won out. And you just realize that it doesn't work. Um, so it becomes a moneymaker thing, but it doesn't mean they didn't try it. And that was probably my reason that I'd give. But Greg, do you want to say anything on that? Larry? Turn up the hearing aid then. I'm right next to you. <laughs> joint promotion and they brought in town from all over but without TV at that time and LA had their own TV show people locked into their own shows it was like when McMahon came after everybody what he went after was their TV shows first the talent and the TV shows he tried to buy the time slots because they built up we had ratings in the Minneapolis and a lot of the AWA area 24 rating with a 64 share of the audience. I mean, that's Super Bowl numbers. And when McMahon would come in, he'd try to buy that time slot because it was made for him. When you went into a new market, it generally took about eight weeks to get your TV show established. So without TV in LA, 
that's probably why it didn't work. I mean, that would be the most educated guess I could give. I got I got to tell you a story about uh, the Burgundy story. When I come back from New York as the Axe, and they had a big campaign, the Axe is back, and the Axe is back to state. So I went out and had a bunch of bumper stickers made, and <laughs> when I went to TV, and I see Gagne pull up. Well, after he went in, I put my bumper stickers <laughs> all over the car. <laughs> Here's the funny part about this. He came back the next week, he says, or a while, he went out and then when he came back, he says, I can't believe it, the, our uh, radios have to be up. I drive down the street and everybody's honking at me. <laughs> hey, the axe is back, the axe is back. And uh, I think it was three, four days later, he found out what I did. <laughs> so in a way, I kind of uh, made him famous. <laughs> As long as I'm here, I like I like the two brothers that uh, one from Arizona and one from California, Nick Bachman, those brothers. Could you guys stand up? Can we give them a hand? Nick? Yeah. They're very proud of their of their brother, and of course that. The whole uh, Blackwinkle family, Warren Blackwinkle was a, uh, a world champion. He started wrestling and uh, uh, Nick was a good friend of mine. Uh, I tell you a story, you know, if you, if you ever had Nick tell you a story, you know how they, he prolonged it, it started and kept going and going and going. Well, anyway, uh, during his career, he had a job at a prison and his job at the prison was to take the guy from the cell to the electric chair. Okay? So uh, there, he's taking him there and he start, Nick started telling him a story. And it went on and, went on and on and on. And finally the guy turned to him and said, can we speed this up a little bit? <laughs> Any questions on this side? Okay, right in the back row there. Yeah. That's you, sir. Me? Yeah. Yep, you, you, me, not me, you. <laughs> you? I have one question for the whole panel and then one that Greg can answer. You're going to ask two questions just like the other guy tried to squeeze that well, Morris over there. The, the, the easy one is, since the AWA was such a large territory, what were your favorite cities to go into and your least favorite cities to go into? And Greg, if you would please tell the story of Mad Dog Vashon in the airplane. Yes. <laughs> okay, who wants to go first? You want Larry to go first for cities? Yes. Which city was your favorite to go into and wrestle, or maybe least favorite city to go into and wrestle? Uh, I had trouble with Mankato, Minnesota. <laughs> Favorite city was Denver, Colorado. It was just the the, the arena there was uh, seated about 12, 14,000 people. It was kind of kind of a round building, and when you would come out, uh, it was electrifying. The people, the building would just you could feel it just pulsate when you came out to the ring and enabled your you know adrenaline to really get pumped up, and you could jump higher and and go harder in the ring. Uh, the least favorite, boy, I don't know. Thank you. Mankato? <laughs> Mankato. It was Mankato. Well, I think Minot was my least favorite because it was 523 miles one way, and usually it was during the winter, and it was like a <laughs> never-ending drive. I remember making the drive my first time with Bo Belinsky, who was a truck driver, and uh, he did something I've never seen done before. He put a pot roast in extra heavy duty foil, wrapped up potatoes and carrots and put uh, Lipton onion soup and a little water 
sealed it up, put it on the manifold, and we drove all the way there. And when we got there, we had a hell of a pot roast dinner. <laughs> I had the same thing with Golden Scale on my first trip. They wanted to know the Mad Dog story. Yeah. Do we want to tell that? It takes, it takes a little while. There's a Reader's Digest version, isn't there? No. <laughs> okay, so we're headed to Omaha and we had a private plane. That it normally was a Navajo chief and it, it uh, seated 12 people. The weight of the wrestlers, it was a total of eight. The pilot, the seven wrestlers. So you had the pilot, the co-pilot, which was usually Nick or Ray because uh, we knew Nick could land the plane and take it off. Ray claimed he could. <laughs> so, and then it was Mad Dog and uh, Adrian, uh, let's see, Baron, Jim, myself, and Steve Olsonowski. And Mad Dog loved to play cribbage. And you know, he didn't talk much. When he talked, it was real short, quick little squirts. So we're playing. And, Mad Dog sitting next to me, and we're about halfway there, and all of a sudden he goes, Quick, can you do me a favor? <laughs> I said, What, Mad Dog? I need to go out and wrestle early tonight because I'm meeting my fiance's family for dinner. I said, Okay, I'll talk to Joe Ducey when we get there, and, and uh, we'll see if we can work that out. So we get to the matches, we get to Omaha, and in the, in the uh, Omaha locker rooms, the two locker rooms, Joe always had a case of beer on, on ice or two cases. And uh, Mad Dog is going to go on. I asked Joe Dusik, Mad Dog, you're on the second match. So Mad Dog had a habit when he hit a big match, and this really wasn't a big one, but he would sometimes drink a pint of whiskey before he'd go in the ring. <laughs> and prior to that, I'll let Jim tell what went on. Well, I was sort of a uh medicine man on the road and I, I <laughs> and because we drove a lot and I, I realized the benefit of some uh, little pills called amphetamines when he's calling bennies and Mad Dog knew that I had these and he told me he said Jim he says when when I get in the plane tonight he says when I get home to flying cloud is there an echo here no. <laughs> uh, when he was getting home to Flying Cloud, then he was going to drive to Montreal. And he said, Jimmy, I need something to keep me up. So I had these two 15 milligram Dexamine, or Dexamil Spaniels, and they were good for about eight hours a, a piece. So I told him, I said, Mad Dog, I said, when you get out of the plane and get in your car, you take one of these with a cup of coffee. You'll make it all the way to Montreal, no problem. And then I said, on the way home, you take the other one. He said, okay. Well, little did I know that as, as the night progressed, not only did he have the uh, whiskey, he had a couple beers, and instead of taking one of those pills, he took both of the pills. So oh, I'll give it to Greg now. <laughs> <laughs> so now he also has a lot of pain in his knees, and he talked to somebody, I think it was Adrian Adonis, gave him a heavy pain pill, Quaalude. So he took that, took that down with the whiskey. So he goes out to the ring and he's got some young opponent that night and we're sitting there talking and he wasn't gone three minutes and he's back in there and he sits down. I said, Mad Dog, are you on? Yes, I beat the hell out of that kid. <laughs> so we're sitting there and he starts drinking the beer. And uh, another match goes on and I said, hey Mad Dog, don't you have to meet your family here? You want to go early? And he's drinking the beer. I'll go when I want to go. <laughs> Just kind of sat back and watched him. And couple more matches and there was an intermission and then Jim and I wrestled for about 45 minutes, came back in to get a cold beer, they're all gone. So the next scene is we drive to the airport, everybody's on the plane, we're waiting for Mad Dog and Steve-O. Mad Dog gets out of the cab, we see him coming, and he's wobbling around like this. He's got barbecue sauce on his beard and on his t-shirt. And I said to Steve, I said, Steve, what the hell happened? He said, well, Mad Dog finished off most of the beer, and then we went and we had wine, and we had barbecue ribs with the family. And on the way back, he was getting a, lot of, a little bit out of hand, so I thought I should call him down, and we smoked a joint. <laughs> so we get Mad Dog, and he's in the back of the plane, and he's pissed off because he can't play cribbage, and he's sitting back there next to Adrian, and 
Adrian's kind of egging him on, and we're at 6,000 feet flying back, and we're somewhere between Iowa and, and Nebraska, and all of a sudden, the whole back of the plane is going boom, boom, boom. And we all ducked. We thought another plane hit us and took the tail off. And the pilot, Brent Winger, is yelling back at us, what's going on back there? And we turn around, and Mad Dog is hanging out the door. He had opened the door. And he's leaned out like this, and he can only see his back part. And he's going, it's so peaceful, I feel like flying tonight. <laughs> Well, we think he's going to jump, and the pilot says, grab him and get him back in here. He said, no way, he's going on his own. <laughs> so now he gets that look when he got in the ring, you know, and he goes, no, oh, she's going to kill somebody. He starts throwing everything that's not attached to the plane out. Yeah. Beer cans, uh, one after another, then the empty case of beer, the garbage can. He opens his wrestling bag, his trunks go, his shaving kit, his wrestling boots, the jock strap, then the bag goes out. And the next thing we see, he's got, there was a chain holding the door on, both the steps and the top, and the pilot said if we wouldn't have had that, it would have blown off, hit the tail, and choo, we'd all gone down. He's got it wrapped around his neck, and he's hanging out backwards, and this is all you can see, and he's going, oh, it's so peaceful. I'm going to fly it. <laughs> so the pilot says, you know, guys, hang on, try to get him in here, we've got to make an emergency landing. So we looked down, and I think it was either Waterloo or... Uh, Cedar Rapids, and we see the runway, there's fire engines, police cars, ambulances with the lights on, the runway is foam, and it was our airlines being held over from the other runway, and here we come in and the pilot has to put it down on one wheel, because if that stairs catches, it's going to flip us over. She said, prepare yourselves for a crash. So that's what we did, we're all huddled down, the pilot comes in and he lays that thing in there on one wheel and shh, we come to a stop. And we turn around and here's Mad Dog. The foam had come in, he's got it all over him. He's peeling it off like this, takes his belt off, he gets out of the plane, he starts walking across the other runways for now they're releasing the Ozark Airlines. So the police come up and they said, what's going on? Get that guy. And we said, I think you better get him, he's crazy. So we ran out to get him, and about that time the planes are released, and they go by, and Jim and I get to him, and he takes, turns around and whacks both of us, and we kind of hit him back, and about that time the jet goes by and blows the dog over, and we go over, and we get up and left him. <laughs> so the police will come running out, and they're trying to handcuff him, and they can't get the handcuffs on him. And Mad Dog's going, I'll kill you, <laughs> cocksuckers. <laughs> They get him back and they say, you got two choices here. We're either going to lock him up for the night or you can take him back. Same thing, he looks at us and says, you better take me back or I'll kill all you guys. <laughs> so we put him on the plane and we strapped him in there with two belts behind the pilot. And away we went, made him back to Minneapolis. And uh, we all got out of the plane before they released him with the belts and took off. That's a true Mad Dog story. Uh, you shut this off? What? I can't hear. I got. I got. I got. I got to give you a sequel to that. Now you got a picture. Uh, this uh, Nebraska or Iowa farmer uh, in the spring of the year, and he's out plowing his fields, and he <clears throat> stops the stops the tractor, gets off. Picks up this dirty old jock strap <laughs> in the middle of his fields, and he looks to the right and he looks to the left. He says, Where the hell is this jock strap going to come from? <laughs> and that's the mad dog story. You know, and as the story was being told, and Larry started this off when we asked about the town that they least like wrestling in, I, I just figured something out. I know why Larry got it so unhappy. He said Mankato. And for those of you that didn't know, in April of 1957, 
Mankato was the very first city that Larry Hennig had his debut match in against Billy Wicks. So maybe that's been the problem. You were unhappy from the very beginning. <laughs> Wrestling would not have been the same without Larry Hennig, I can tell you. He, he was a plus. Okay, let's have another question. Uh, yes, sir, with the cap on there. Uh, being from Amarillo, do you all have any uh, memories or, or funny stories working in Amarillo with any of the, the families up there? Okay, I'm going to start with Larry because I know Larry worked the Amarillo ter territory for a while. So, any stories of Amarillo? Yeah, I got a lot of. If you, wherever the funks are, there's a lot of stories. You, know, <laughs> you already know that. But uh, one story that uh, there was a favorite bar we all went into, and the rodeo guys went in the same bar and the wrestlers, and we got into kind of a pissing argument about wrestling and and, and riding bulls. And so I, that was during my drinking day. I haven't drank in 25 years. God, I needed that. <laughs> anyway, so I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I'll wrestle you. And uh, then I said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get on your bull and I'm going to ride the bull. He said, you're on. That was the I, so we go to the arena, I get on the ball, and if you could cut a second up any faster. <laughs> I, I lasted about 30 seconds, is all I ever did. And I want to tell you, I never forgot that. And in the, these rodeo riders that you see on TV, they're the real deal. And uh, it didn't take me very long to smarten up. But, and another one was Wahoo McDaniels. We shot, we were drinking and uh, we had a convertible and we shot 147 rabbits between Odessa and Lovick. <laughs> Did either of you two have any Amarillo stories? I, I was, I was uh, just in Amarillo uh, when uh, WWF had run it, but uh, uh, the funks uh, are uh, what the guy is are to the AWA, the fun circuit in Amarillo, Texas, and Texas, because uh, both Dory and uh, <laughs> Terry are just, they're completely different, and, and both are, are masters in the ring, and uh, I remember one time this was, and Greg was involved with this with WCW, they had a, some sort of a jamboree pay-per-view down in Atlanta, and Nick Bachwinkle wrestled Dory Funk, and they were both approaching 60 years old, I think. And they were there was five or six matches there. Honest to God, they had a 20-minute draw, and it stole the show. Yep. It was absolutely, I don't know if any of you saw it, but it was a fantastic match. So the Funks were incredible, and uh, Terry last night, he'll be here tonight too, so he's a real character. I think the match you're talking about was from 93, Slammerie. Does that seem yeah. to be the one? Yeah. It was a uh, 20 minute uh, match with, with Nick. Was it 15? Yeah. All right, we'll take your word for it. Okay. But, you know, when you're close to, uh, you know, Nick would have been, uh, you know, they've both been well into their 50s at that point, and that, that's phenomenal. Anybody else have a question? Yes, sir. Out to all of you, what was your last match, and why was that your last match? What? <laughs> Okay, the question is, what was your last match and why was that la your last match? Who wants to go, Larry? Do you want to? Uh, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> no more matches. I had a little concussion a little while ago. I'll turn this over to the younger guys. George, I can't remember my last match either, do you? Come on, historian, help me out. Uh, uh, we finally stumped the genius. No? You think about it a minute. I know I got a little fed up with it because uh, you know the WWE had pretty much taken over, taken all over all the the top talent out of the AWA, and, and you'd have to get in the ring with young kids that weren't. Um, some of them were not trained properly, um, didn't have good technique in the ring. And uh, it was at that point in your career where you don't need to be teaching young guys that don't know what they're doing because you get hurt quite a bit. 
and that was what happened. And it was uh, I realized it was time to hang it up, and I had to really retire because of a herniated disc that I got in my lower back from a Jerry Blackwell power slam on the cement floor at the TV station. But um, you know, I, I really can't remember the last kid because it was nobody, no big star. Now there's a question about this timing, but I think my last match was on my 50th birthday in uh, 1999. I was uh, working for Ken Patera, who was running a series of independent shows throughout uh, Minnesota, and I believe it was either Albert Lee or Austin, and I was uh, in the ring with uh, Jim the Anvil Neidhart, and he and Ken had spent the night down there earlier, and they were in the cohabitating with a couple strippers, and I, I think they were out all night because I remember Jim putting a headlock on me, and I swear to God, his heartbeat was about 190 per minute. So uh, I realized during that match that I couldn't do what I used to do, and uh, after that match, I never got in the ring again. So uh, that was it, uh, 1999, August 13th. All right, I'm going to be uh, somewhat polite here. I'm going to ask you guys, we're a little bit over what our normal time was. Do you want to talk a little bit more? Do you want us to wrap this up? You tell me. Because I know we see some more hands out there, so it's up to you guys. You're okay? All right. Um, well, I haven't seen anybody leaving. young lady right there in front. Did you get the question? Okay, she wanted to know if you knew if you wanted to do tag team work or did you want to be a solo wrestler? How did it work out for you? I prefer tag team because you can last longer. And uh, I was, uh, wasn't was known as a high flower, flyer. Uh, most of my work was, uh, was on the ground. I was... <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that uh, I'll say for Larry, he, he mentioned just now that he was uh, not the high flyer. If any of you are old enough to remember the tag team of Larry Hennig and Harley Race, uh, Harley Race was the bump taker of that team. And, and Harley was only in his very early 20s at the time. So. <laughs> You know, and learning the, learning the ropes, so to speak. But Harley was the one that took the bumps, and, and Larry was, uh, and you called it surface transportation one time. Yes, yes. So, okay, Greg, let's have, let's have you answer the question. You know, I didn't have a favorite, but most of our success came as tag team. Uh, Jim and I just gelled a lot, and uh, I think the secret to our success was um, neither one of us had an ego. We worked. Our goal in professional wrestling and the way we were taught fundamentally by Billy Robinson and Vern uh, was to go out and have the best card, the best match on the card every night. And that's what we tried to do. We weren't the biggest guys, but uh, we, we made sure and hopefully when people left the arena, we gave them their money's worth. And we would we'd watch every match and try not to duplicate it. And with the talent that we had to work with, uh, we didn't duplicate too many matches, and um, it was fun, it was a great experience, but also as a single wrestler, we did the same thing, put that effort in to make sure that people got their money's worth, so uh, more success as a tag team, but I'd love to do both of them. Well, I think uh, I sort of much, uh, pretty much echo uh, what Greg said. Uh, basically, uh, in pro wrestling, you do uh, the best you can to make as most money as you can, whether it be as a single or a tag team. So, uh, like I said before, uh, Greg and I were uh, so blessed to have the talent to work with, and it worked out good, and it was very profitable for us. So, uh, I, I just think you have to uh, uh, go what works best with you, and that's the way it was. One of the things that you were talking about a moment ago when you mentioned uh, Nick Bockwinkle and Dory Fung Jr. going to that 15-minute draw. The, um, I, I point out that Jim Brunzel in December of 1975 and December of 1976 in St. Paul, Minnesota, 
he wrestled both matches, or it goes a year apart, but he wrestled matches against Nick Bachwinkel, both of them to 60 minute draws, 60 minute Broadway. And to this day, if I were to name one of my favorite matches to, that I remember, uh, it was that one. Bobby Heenan didn't interfere in either of them, Greg Gagne didn't interfere in either of them, and they were just, they worked really great together. And then as I mentioned earlier, Nick said, he made the comment to me about Greg Gagne, he said, anytime I worked with Greg, it was a night off. And so I think that that tells you there. Okay, next question. Yes, sir. For uh, Greg and uh, Jim, you're talking about all the great talent you had to work with. Uh, could you tell me, like, what, who was your favorite team? Like, who did you have the best chemistry with, like, to work with? And, like, your favorite? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jesse to uh, really get um, get the match over because he couldn't give you a good comeback. Uh, but we still had the chemistry that drew money, and I don't think there was anybody that we didn't work with that we had chemistry with. And I'm not bragging about it, it was just they were that good, and uh, we adapted to whatever style we had to. I agree exactly what Greg said. Uh, any combination with the Heenan family, uh, uh, Stevens was incredible in the ring. He was an absolute genius. Uh, you know, he could be out drinking uh, 12 hours a night before and get in the ring and go 60 minutes, and, and it, it felt like you were in there with a ghost. I mean, that's how good he was. And I, I just want to mention one thing. Um, Greg and I were involved in uh, a cage match in uh, St. Paul Civic Center that had the record house uh, it was over 19,000 people there, and we were against Adrian and Jesse. And uh, you think back on <clears throat> the fact that in the Twin Cities, especially in St. Paul, Minneapolis, pro wrestling didn't get its due justice as covering, you know, because they had all the major sports and they didn't uh, uh, give pro wrestling really a, a good amount of airtime or uh, complimentary press or anything, but. They had 19,000 people at the St. Paul Civic Center, which out to 
all the, uh, the concerts, all the hockey. And I'll never forget that night because uh, two days later, I got the biggest check I ever got. And I still remember it was $4,654. So and that was with Adrian and uh, Jesse. I did get that money. <laughs> <laughs> you could talk a little bit about his Playboy Buddy Rose. He was like, I think he was just an ultimate great heel. And could you speak a little bit about Buddy? Because I know I'm a, in the winning ends of the AWA, him and him and uh, Doug and the Rockets had different fabulous matches for you guys. Before I give that to Greg to answer, and I don't want to get yelled at because Larry might hit me if I don't do this. And in the Pacific Northwest. Larry is very proud, and, and he should would very well be. He was in the Pacific Northwest with Kurt, exactly. and they were Pacific uh, Northwest Tag Team Champions I together, see. father and son team. And Playboy Buddy Rose was one of the opponents that they won that title from. Yeah. So uh, with that, I'll let Greg answer your question. Well, uh, first time I had experience with Buddy Rose, him and I, I would drive the ring truck. That's how I broke into the business from the bottom up and then drive that ring truck and, and Buddy went with me and he was constantly picking my brain about wrestling and he wanted to go in. He did go through Vern's camp and he turned out to be a great performer. Unfortunately, he had some, some problems, but uh, he was a great performer in the ring and him and the Rockers with Doug Summers, they had unbelievable matches. And uh, he went up to, he sent a lot of people up to Don Owens because, you know, it was a weekly territory. The guys got good experience uh, where they could learn, uh, you know, to throw them in with all the top talent in the AWA. There just wasn't, uh, give them enough time to develop their, their personalities, their ring work before they come back and get an opportunity to work with the, the top people, you know, otherwise they just get eaten up in the matches. Isn't that special? Guy wrestled for 20 years and can only remember one good match he had. <laughs> huh? Yeah, he said he had one good match. <laughs> oh, I got you now. I got the hearing aid. Well, anyway. Uh, I want to thank all of you, uh, the people here, and especially from the from the Hennig family. Uh, I got 25 grandkids, and I'll, I'll I can't remember their names, so I'll give you the numbers: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. 25. And I would like to, to three generations of, of uh, Hennig Wrestling, Larry Hennig, Kurt Hennig, and Joe Hennig is with the WWE, just signed a new contract. And you got to remember that uh, you got to think of the WWE as a Ferris wheel, and uh, Vince owns a Ferris wheel, and Vince owns all the seats. So if you get a chance to get on that Ferris wheel, it's kind of special and he's doing real good. So again, I want to thank you for Irene, the Hennig family, the Bachwinkle family, and what was the last name? <laughs> okay, thank you very much.